Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to, uh, to Lynn, to the Institute, to, to Deep for, for bringing us all together. Thank you to, uh, to Tremaine and, and Common Sense and, and Hampshire for, for making it all possible. Um, I'm from, uh, work for the city of Bridgeport. My role there is uh, director of the Office of Planning and Economic Development, which is a little bit uh, unique for Connecticut City where, or Connecticut municipality where we have the entire suite of land use functions under one roof for everything from you know, forward looking economic development and planning to building inspection, um, zoning enforcement, uh, basically everything that, that governs, governs built form, which allows us I think to be a little bit more comprehensive in our approach um, in implementing something that is um, as uh, far-reaching and as uh, you know cross-cutting as, as sustainability. We got involved here uh, before actually my involvement in the city. I was a consultant to the city uh, in 2009, 2010 when uh, Mayor Bill Finch took office. One of the first things that he did was established an executive order that uh, created a, or signed an executive order that established a public-private partnership. Uh, you, you guys all know where Bridgeport is, right? Mm -hmm. little, little city on the sound. Uh, it's been in the news maybe the last 24 hours. Um, so, you know, first, you know, there, there'd been a lot of work looking at municipalities um, around the, the tri-state region, and this is, this is a little bit out of date now, I think, probably has been strongly influenced by the work of the sustainable New Jersey folks. But at the time, uh, this was the location of municipal scale uh, interaction in one of the several climate, um, you know, climate programs, whether they were participating in ICLE or uh, cool cities or any number of programs. And we, we were very interested, again, at the time, not working for the city, in the fact that around Bridgeport, we kind of had this cluster that didn't really exist anywhere else in, in the metropolitan area, and that that might be an opportunity to, um, to really make something uh, unparalleled happen there. So the mayor took office, um, signed his first executive order, first and only executive order, that established a public-private partnership between the city and the Bridgeport Regional Business Council, which is the regional chamber of commerce. Um, and, it, and it conducted a few things. First and foremost, did a carbon inventory. Um, and that inventory taught us two very important lessons. Um, first, it taught us that the city government, uh, city operations, constituted about 4% of the emissions that were taking place or being, being created within the city. So we could shut down City Hall tomorrow and everything that it does and we'd still only be like halfway towards meeting the Kyoto targets. And so there was going to have to be robust participation from the private and the civic sector if we were gonna have any, any meaningful action. We knew from the outset this wasn't just gonna be about installing LEDs in city buildings or you know, changing the municipal fleet. This was gonna have to be um, something that took place in the neighborhoods and, and in the employment centers um, throughout. The other thing we learned was that uh, the average resident of the city of Bridgeport produces about 7,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions per year, whereas the average resident of any one of the surrounding uh, suburban municipalities produces more than double that. Um, so, you know, just by living in the city, where you have shared walls, you have mass transit, you have walkability, um, you have uh, you know different energy generation options, that can constitute half. Uh, emission reduction. There's no other policy that we're looking at. And we've heard a lot today about, you know, transportation and the role that transportation plays in generating emissions. Not a lot about the land use piece, right? It's not just about increasing the carbon or decreasing the carbon content of fuel. It's not just about increasing the efficiency of the vehicle fleet, but it's about driving less. Um, and, and driving less only happens in places where you have other options, options like walking, options like biking, options like transit, um, which only exists in certain certain type of community. So we created this public-private partnership um, and launched an initiative called Be Green uh, with funding from Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, Fairfield County Community Foundation, and others. Um, we set up an advisory group of about 30 people. We had modeled it after Plan YC 2030 in New York City, um, which myself and others had, had participated in. Um, so we had an advisory group that, that included, um, you know, uh, thought leaders like Dan Esty, who was, who was uh, still at Yale at the time, um, included corporate leaders like UTC uh, Power, which was 
still in Connecticut at the time, um, and, and a lot of community and, and, and uh, civic and business leaders locally. And, uh, and those individuals and representatives from their organizations constituted the, the, um, the uh, participation in five technical committees that looked at all the different areas where we thought we could achieve emissions, whether it was land use and transportation or building and energy or uh, green jobs and education. And they came up with thousands of ideas, um, literally thousands of ideas, and we called them down uh, ultimately to those 65 action items that we were thought were best calibrated for the type of community that we were, the resources that we had available to achieve the, uh, the greatest uh, emissions reduction possible. Um, these, were the, uh, these were the groups, Speed Green 2020 is the plan. Um, it's it's award-winning at, at the, the state level as well as the, uh, as well as the federal level from EPA. The next piece that we did, which I think I think is is rather unique, is when uh, when the stimulus program uh, included energy efficiency block grants, which I think we all hoped would become a uh, a, uh, a a long long term uh, funding source for local government and title communities to do these types of projects. Um, but when that infusion of cash came from the Department of Energy and was predicated on doing an energy plan, a lot of places used that money to do an energy plan for their facilities, right, and come up with a blueprint for how they were going to invest in renewable power or building efficiency within their facilities. What we did was we used our energy plan funding to create uh, a quantification of the emissions reduction and energy savings potential of those 65 action items. And so just a snapshot of it here, this um, demonstrates the projected emissions growth that would occur in our community. Um, and we did two different projection uh, strategies, population-based and sector-based. The green and the blue line um, show uh, what what the baseline projection would result in, 6% increase uh, or 13% uh, increase. But we also did a growth scenario, right? We said, okay, that's fine. We're 150,000 people. We got 60,000 jobs. That's great. We know that those people are going to, uh, you know, based on current trends, are going to consume more electricity, produce more emissions over time. But we don't want to be a city of 150,000 people. We don't want to be a city of 60,000 jobs. We actually want to turn the 10% of our land that's underutilized or vacant or brownfields into productive land with jobs with housing. We want to grow our city. And so we're not going to target emissions reduction based off our current levels. We're not going to target emissions reduction based off our trend growth. We're going to target our emissions reduction levels off of a total that we hope to achieve based on an influx of population and an influx of employment coming to our city. And that's what you see there up in the orange and the red. Uh, we then uh, used, um, folks might be familiar with um, uh, Professor Sokolow at Princeton, the, the wedge theory, breaking down the emissions reduction target into a series of kind of smaller attainable goals. And what you see basically the top of that line is the sector-based expanded growth projection, which is the uh, most significant potential emissions growth projection that we thought we could be seeing in the city over the course of the coming uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, we see our reduction goal down there in the dashed line. And then we broke that, that down into wedges, how much we thought we could achieve through green building activity, how much through renewable energy, how much through land use and transportation policy, tied back to those 65 action items. Um, and then drilling down even further, if you focus in on any one of those wedges, and this is a zoom in on the uh, land use and transportation wedge, the, uh, the blue wedge on this graph, that is then broken down into individual strategies. What portion of that wedge can we achieve by boosting Bridgeport's regional train ridership? What portion can we achieve by transferring auto trips to bus transit with enhanced uh, local transit? What portion can we achieve through transit-oriented development by influencing the land use pattern in our city, by reducing vehicle, uh, excuse me, municipal fleet emissions? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then those are, tar those are broken down into a phased approach so that we have benchmarks in every five-year period. And so we've actually, since the creation of the plan in 2010, we've actually done a first update. We did a little bit early in 2014. So we can look back at this 
and see which of the action items are underperforming, which are better performing, and we can shift resources to ensure that we're allocating the limited staff time and, and the, the limited, uh, the limited uh, financial resources that we have available to us into those strategies that are best calibrated for success within a municipality like Bridgeport. And in doing so, we hope we can be a model for, for communities uh, like ours around the region and around the country. And I should mention that um, uh, this work is, is overseen and the, and the update in particular was, was managed out of our sustainability office. And I'm joined here today by Christopher Anastasi, who's the, the director of our sustainability office, who can uh, answer any questions that folks have about that. Um, I'll focus now on one of the uh, action item areas. One of the working groups was energy efficiency and gener generation. Uh, we did the comprehensive energy plan. We, uh, we implemented or created an energy improvement district, which, which I, as, as economic development director, am one of the board members on as a mechanism to, uh, to potentially bond, to raise revenue, and to implement renewable energy projects, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail on these. I think some of them are, are fairly standard, like municipal building retrofit and performance contracting, um, some of which are, are um, a little bit you know, more aggressive perhaps, like, like CPACE, which has been very successful for us. Uh, but the thing that I'll focus on here is um, the eco-technology park, which was one of those 65 action items, uh, one of the ones that came out of this working group, and the one that I think has gone from uh, really kind of writing on the back of a napkin to something of, of great substance in a, in a very short amount of time. Um, this is a, a graphic of the Eco-Technology Park. When we were working through this in 2010, we, we looked at you know, what was taking place around the city, and we kind of honed in on this underperforming industrial district in the western end of the city. And, and um, not to go too far off on this tangent, but you know, we're all representative of, of Connecticut municipalities here. We obviously have a, a municipal finance problem with our over-dependence on property tax. Um, much like you know, many of the communities in this room, Bridgeport is land constrained. We're 16.1 square miles. About 50% of our assessed value is tax exempt, whether it's hospitals, universities, churches, synagogues, nonprofits, government buildings, et cetera. We're trying to squeeze um, a lot of resources out of a very limited amount of land. And so we can't possibly afford to not be as productive as possible, both with job creation and tax creation, on every square inch that we have available to us. So this area jumped out as a big opportunity for, uh, for a significant, significant delta moving forward. What was most interesting about this area, though, um, through our sustainability plan, one of the kind of mantras that we, that we kept coming back to at the urging of, of Mayor Finch was this idea of, of re-characterizing waste, right? Re rethinking what waste means to our community. We have all this stuff that's just leaving our community every day or is being produced by our community and thrown to the wayside. Perhaps we can turn it into something new that can be the fuel to a process that creates jobs, creates revenue, creates, um, creates um, you know, economic benefit. And one thing that we had going on here in the Eco Technology Park was one of the state's trash energy facilities, um, one of the, the more successful ones, part of the whole um, the system statewide, um, the, the wheelabrator plant, which um, is kind of in the, in the middle there. It's an 80 megawatt facility. Um, you know, while it's, it's not incredibly sexy, right, it's burning trash and turning it into electricity, it at, at its very basic level is taking something that otherwise would be waste and turning it into something a little bit more interesting. Um, we, also had, uh, we also had in this area um, the first liquefied natural gas fueling station east of the Mississippi. And, you know, those two ingredients don't really add up to all that much, but it was enough to kind of spark an idea that said, we want to we want to build off this, and uh, we want to create something that can that can form the foundation for a new economy, a green collar economy for our city. So as I mentioned, we had the waste recovery plant, uh, 70 megawatts, um, and and it had all of these opportunities, right? While it was doing something, you know, somewhat interesting, you know, there was an opportunity to sequester the carbon, maybe grow some algae. There was an opportunity to capture the heat, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, it was located, it is located directly adjacent to a water pollution control facility. It's using a million gallons a day of potable water. And right next door, you've got a 30 million gallon plant 
that's dumping heated water or warmer water out into a Black Rock Harbor and ultimately Long Island Sound. Maybe there's, maybe there's a connection that we can make here. And this was this industrial symbiosis concept that we were learning about and starting to, to connect the dots um, that might exist. Our first big project um, after kind of branding the, the Eco Technology Park was, was the fuel cell plant. And, and each one of these initiatives has required really a Herculean effort at the city level, the state level, sometimes federal, um, to, to change rules, to, to enter into agreements, all to make you know, what we all think is, is the natural uh, progression of things possible. Um, the fuel cell would not have happened but for legislative action some time ago, and I, I don't have all the history as to exactly when Project 150 was started, um, but you know, a, a, a desire to do 150 megawatts of renewable power in the city. Um, not much of it was ultimately realized, as, as I think folks are aware, um, but one of the two plants that was ultimately created was, was the fuel cell plant in Bridgeport. We had reserved several acres of land for this purpose for some time, um, but it wasn't until uh, a PPA was created between uh, fuel cell energy and, uh, and um, Eversource, now Eversource, uh, slides a little bit out of date. Um, so interestingly, the plant is located in UI territory but provides electricity to Eversource territory. Um, it wasn't until uh, Dominion came in as an ultimate purchaser of the facility itself. Um, it wasn't until the city changed its ordinance to eliminate class one renewable energy from being subject to building permit fees so that you're only paying building permit fees based on the value of the electrical and the mechanical and the concrete pads and, and all of the stuff that goes in support of the renewable energy. But if you had to pay building permit fees based on the value of a fuel cell, um, the project stops making economic sense. Uh, similarly, if they had to pay full taxes, the project would not make economic sense. So we had to get through city council a tax incentive agreement um, to, to make a particular uh, tax value that made sense for the deal. And while we've been criticized for offering a tax break to this project, doesn't require any city services, and on a per acre basis, it is the fifth most productive tax producing property in the city of Bridgeport. So despite offering a significant tax agreement that reduces what the theoretical bill would have been. It's the fifth most productive on a per acre basis. And when you're dealing with a land constrained community like we are in Connecticut, you always have to look at it on a per acre basis. Um, it ultimately is a 15 megawatt plant. It is the largest fuel cell power plant um, outside of South Korea, largest in the Western Hemisphere, largest in the Northern Hemisphere, largest in uh, largest in North America, largest in the U.S. Um, sounds like we'll get passed by uh, by the new plant in in the Naugatuck Valley, but but for now we get to we get to say we're number one. Um, the next thing that we that we put in motion was the Green Energy Park. Again, this required a whole set of of rule changes. It required uh, legislative action to get to allow utilities to get back into the generation game on a pilot basis, 10 megawatts per uh, utility. Uh, UI chose to do five of those ten within the city of Bridgeport. It's a five megawatt park. It's about three megawatt solar, which is about 70 percent built right now on a former landfill. Uh, it'll be the largest urban solar array in New England and a two megawatt fuel cell. Um, it required a, a land disposition agreement with the city. It's a 20-year lease. Um, this was a very difficult project to get through public opinion. Um, you know, in, in retrospect, you know, a lesson we learned on this was we had, we had thought that people would be so proud of this branding of the city of Bridgeport that we kept talking about how this great thing is going to be visible from I-95 and it's going to be a symbol to everyone passing by that Bridgeport's on a different path. We didn't realize that to most people, visible from I-95 means it's going to be visible from my house. And we faced a ton of neighborhood opposition, not least of which because it's adjacent to a Frederick Law Olmsted Park. And preservationists tend not to see things like solar panels or wind farms as, as being complementary to those historic landscape elements, but rather detracting from it. I, I, I disagree. Um, but this was a, this was a hard won battle um, and one that we're, we're finally now seeing come to fruition. 
it'll be turned on in, uh, in a couple months. Um, I heard some talk this morning, certainly in the food discussion, about anaerobic digestion. Um, we, have, uh, we have a few in the works. Uh, the city put out an RFP. Uh, we put some property on the market adjacent to our water pollution control uh, authority uh, to enter into a, a power purchase agreement with an anaerobic digester that would take the sludge from the plant, turn it into electricity to power the plant. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, been working with DEEP very closely on that. They've now received all their air permits, their, uh, their waste permits, et cetera. Um, that should be in construction shortly. That will fully power uh, the waste treatment pl plant. Um, it'll take the sludge. You know, right now we're basically, even though you're, you're dewatering it to an extent, you're still trucking mostly water to you know, New Haven so it can get burned. We're reducing the truck trips um, like 20-fold that'll be passing by um, in affordable housing complex, a lot of neighborhood benefits. Um, and we're also uh, in the works with a couple food digesters, again, that wouldn't be possible but for the legislation uh, that mandates the large producers uh, send, send uh, the waste to facilities like this. We're also uh, a beneficiary of the similar legislation in New York City because they have a 100-mile radius, which we fall inside, so we can take advantage of both the Connecticut and the New York City markets. Um, and, and these have spin-off economic development potential. The, the digester that's going to be in, under construction shortly at WPCA is, going, is, is entering into a community benefits agreement with the public housing project that is next door. And part of that agreement is going to be the creation of a greenhouse that will use um, you know, some of the uh, material uh, to create several jobs uh, for the local population in, in urban agriculture directly adjacent to the plant. The thermal loop is, is probably something that we're most uh, excited about. Um, I'll say proud of because we've gotten it this far. It's not yet under construction, but thanks to the help from, uh, from the Green Bank and uh, to the, thanks to the support from the, uh, the administration and, and the state legislature this past session, I think we have a, a very real chance of getting this done. You know, we had to, you know, we had to change uh, the classification so that they could be a utility, so that they can cross public rights of way. You know, I mean, the, the myriad little moves that you have to make to, to allow something like this, which seems natural to take place, Ultimately, the thermal loop will capture the waste heat that goes up the stack from the trash to energy facility and the little bit of residual heat after the heat capture that's left over from the fuel cell, pipe it downtown. And this is not the old school steam loops like exist in Hartford or university campuses across the country. Those are first generation. This is fifth generation. It's basically hot water. It's shallow. There's not a lot of digging. It's actually not that expensive to, to move long distances. You don't get a lot of degradation in the quality. Uh, we're going to bring it downtown. We're going to put it into you know, heat exchangers and chillers in the buildings. And the amount of heat that currently goes up the stack from the trash to energy facility will allow us to take 6 million square feet of existing buildings off of their local heating and cooling plants. Six million square feet of building that will no longer have gas or oil boilers, that will no longer have any electric heating and cooling, um, that will have lower operating costs. And so when we look at ourselves compared to any other transit-oriented walkable downtown, now we have a lower operating cost for our building stock, creating another competitive advantage, which makes it more likely that you'll want to live or, or work in our downtown. But all of this was about job creation, ultimately. It was about creating the infrastructure conditions to allow small business to grow, relocate, or start up within this eco-technology park. And we've had some great successes. Park City Green it was a partnership with the city of Bridgeport that we partially funded through CDBG. Again, uh, the recipient of support from the state legislature by passing the mattress recycling legislation that created a pipeline uh, of product for their, for their activity. Um, they have a partnership with uh, St. Vincent's DuPaul so that they're training and utilizing the reentry community uh, for, their, for their employment. Um, they are also recycling books. The facility is stacked to the rafters. It's like a 50-foot high industrial building stacked to the rafters with mattresses now that the legislation has gone into effect. But I got to be honest, you know, you think about how political decisions, or maybe political is the wrong word, but how decisions in the political realm affect you know, job creation affect reality. The delay in the implementation of the mattress recycling bill resulted in you know, this business hanging on 
just by, you know, just by the, the, the shoestring to get to the point where now it's booming. Um, now they're taking overflow from, from other facilities around the region. A couple really interesting companies, Bridgeport Biodiesel, um, undergoing a ma massive extant expansion right now to 10, uh, it's actually 13 million gallons. Um, they've decided to go bigger. It'll be the largest biodiesel uh, refinery in the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic in Bridgeport, Connecticut. American Oil Solutions recycles tires into oil. You, they have this proprietary boiler. You put in a tire, the metal drops out of the radial, you get a little block of metal in the bottom, it boils the thing down back into oil, a little gas comes off, you use the gas to fuel the process, the boiler's wrapped in these water tubes, you use that to heat the building, you basically put in tires, it's self-sustaining, and you get out oil. It's incredible. And it's not just about job creation, it's about green workforce development. So there's job training here, you know, working with the workplace. We've got one of the best workplace, uh, one of the best workforce training uh, boards in, in the nation um, in the workplace with Joe Carbone. They got a significant uh, Department of Labor grant a few years ago to do training in recycling, training in um, transit, training in uh, green landscaping, a whole bunch of jobs. But we want to make sure that that workforce can also locate in close proximity to the eco-technology park. So we have probably one of the most visible buildings on I-95, if you've ever driven through Bridgeport, exit 26, north side of the highway, massive, hulking, 400,000 square foot former industrial building. Interestingly, the, uh, the, the home of American Gramophone, uh, where Columbia Records uh, pressed all their records for, for generations. Um, been vacant for decades. It was in three owners. Um, we had a really hard time kind of getting things off the ground. The city was proactive. Again, Mayor Finch has given us um, you know, the leadership to allow us to take these kind of risks. We took some buildings through eminent domain. We took some buildings through tax foreclosure so that we can combine the entire block. We have a developer. It just broke ground a couple weeks ago. 325 units of workforce housing within walking distance of the Eco Technology Park, a charter school, and a daycare, um, rounding out this facility and better connecting it to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, all of this is, you know, supported by a series of other policies. We've got we've got two microgrids, one fuel cell supported, one natural gas supported. Um, we're very involved in virtual net metering. You know, also working to try and make the legislation work better for us. Um, but little steps. The last thing I'll say is, of course, coastal community. 24% uh, of our land areas in the 100-year floodplain, including much of the eco-technology park. We were lucky enough to be the only community in New England to be invited to participate in a federal competition called Rebuild by Design, which was a post-Sandy initiative. Uh, we were one of seven municipalities to win an award. We got $10 million, and we're currently designing our flood protection system, working in close collaboration with, with Serco, with OPM, and with the other state agencies, so that we can not just create um, this uh, reframing of the city uh, to the green-collar economy, but we can ensure that there'll be prosperity uh, and equity for decades to come. Thank you.